Whether you're a brand new or long-term player, these are some tips you need to know to survive your first week in 7 days' Alpha 21. Let me know your top tips for starting out in the comments below. And if you want to stay updated with all things 7 days and survival gaming, hit that subscribe button. The first thing you're going to need to do is run through your tutorial quests. Sometimes it can be tempting to run out into the world and figure things out as you go along. But these tutorial quests are actually really useful in a few ways. The tutorial quests will cover the following topics. Craft a bedroll, craft a stone axe, craft plant fibre clothing, craft a wooden club, craft a bow and arrows, craft and place a wood frame, upgrade the wood frame, craft and place a campfire, and locate a trader. Not only will these quests give you a good head start with a couple of weapons for both close and long ranged attacks, as well as showing you how to gather plant fibres, wood and stone, they'll also give you a handy map marker and on screen heads up as to where your nearest trader is located. Most importantly though, completing these tutorial quests will reward you with 4 perk points to get you started, which can then be assigned immediately. At this point, you'll want to quickly establish your first home base, which will keep you safe during the night time, give you somewhere to store your loot and resources, and provide you a little cover for crafting and smelting. I'd recommend finding an existing POI, close to the trade route post you've located in your tutorial quests, and usually are locked for a smaller scale POI as these won't have many enemies to clear out and won't be too difficult to take over. You'll want to test the health of the walls as well, making sure they have a good amount of health, optimally over a thousand, as this will be much stronger than say a wooden house with a hundred health walls. I prefer to have a location with a second floor, which acts as a vantage point for long ranged attacks, gives you space to fall back if your walls are breached, and ultimately gives you more space for placing crafting facilities and storage. Once the location is clear, you can place down your crafted bedroll, which will not only act as a respawn point, but also as a form of land claim, preventing enemies from respawning in the location, and also places a handy map marker on screen so that you can easily locate your base once you've headed back out. Later on, you may want to create two different bases. One will be your home base, and your other is typically referred to as a horde base. The horde base is usually where you'll go during a Blood Moon horde. This is to protect your home base from being damaged and loot containers from being destroyed. But for now, settle into your home base to get started. Once you've staked your claim and set up your first home base, it's a good idea to go out and introduce yourself to the nearest trader. At traders, you can buy and sell goods like food, resources, weapons, ammo, vehicles and mods, as well as taking on quests. Quests will be useful early game as they offer a few benefits when completed. Quests are separated into 5 different tiers and to progress through the tiers you must complete 7 quests in your current tier. When starting out you'll have access to tier 1 quests and these will be one of the following. Fetch, Fetch and Clear, Clear, Buried Supplies, Restore Power and Infested Clear. Each of these quests will focus on a different objective and provide different benefits to completion. For example, the clear quests focus on clearing zombies from a POI, so will net you a larger amount of XP, which can be very useful early game. As well as buried supplies, which typically contain a healthy amount of food and seeds, which are vital in the early game before you've managed to get your farming production set up. Another important benefit to completing the first tier of quests is the tier completion rewards. One of which is a bicycle which will help you travel further distances in shorter time frames and cuts out the need to scavenge for the resources to craft it yourself and leveling into Grease Monkey to unlock the schematic. To get the bicycle, you'll need to complete 7 tier 1 quests at the same trader location, which can be done fairly quickly by bashing out as many quests as you can as quickly as you can. Fetch quests are as simple as fetching a bag of supplies which can be done the quickest Clears can be fast as well, depending on how comfortable you are with combat, and buried supplies take a little longer as you'll have to dig within a radius to discover the supplies. There are so many food options in 7 days that it can be a little confusing starting out and much of it will be inaccessible to you in the early game. You'll want to really keep on top of managing your hunger and stamina, so making sure you have plenty of food is a must. 
One of the easiest meals to make is eggs and bacon, which only require two ingredients, meat and egg, which are easy to find in most areas of the map. To craft eggs and bacon, you only need the first level of MasterChef, the campfire you made earlier, and a cooking pot mod attachment. If you don't have any eggs, you can also cook boiled meat with the cooking pot and jars of water, or charred meat if you don't have any water. Ideally though, you want to be crafting some of the easier stews like meat, vegetable or hobo stews, as these provide massive increases to hunger, stamina and health regeneration, and only require MasterChef's level 2 and level 3. Traders and vending machines will also provide food as long as you've got the dukes to buy them, and food stockpiles can be found all over the map in various POIs. So there's always a way to scavenge up food if you decide to save your perks for other skills outside of MasterChef as well. You'll also need to supply yourself with water to stay hydrated. You'll want to avoid drinking murky water as this causes dysentery and reduces your health by 5 points of damage and dysentery isn't very fun. You'll be able to collect 3 murky water a day from the dew collector facility but you'll also be able to find water filtration mods for your headgear to drink directly from water sources too. Trader outposts and vending machines are stocked with water and other drinkable items, and they can be found by scavenging POIs, so there's plenty of ways to source water early on. There are a few key crafting facilities that you'll need to build as soon as possible. The most important is probably the workbench, followed by the forge. You can craft the workbench by leveling up in the advanced engineering skill, which you'll need two levels in to access the tinkerer tier of the skill. Once this has been unlocked, you can build your workbench and place it in your newfound home. You could do this relatively quickly by using the points you received from completing the initial tutorial quests. The forge can also be unlocked for crafting by unlocking the first level of advanced engineering known as blacksmith, which will also give you the ability to craft items with the forge 20% faster. The campfire will also enable you to craft more complex types of food, which is a must for maintaining your stamina levels and staving off hunger and thirst debuffs. Some food recipes and boiling water, for example, do require mod attachments to the campfire as well though, so keep an eye out for things like beakers and grills. Later on, you will also be able to craft the chemistry workstation for crafting medical supplies and medicines, as well as the cement mixer to craft more complex building materials like cobblestone and concrete to fortify your structures. It's important to be aware that things that produce heat like torches, campfires and forges also increase your heat map. The heat map is an indicator that increases with certain actions like using firearms, mechanical equipment, using heat emitting facilities or breaking blocks. So be mindful of the number of facilities crafting at once, especially if you're nearby mining or firing off weapons. When your heat map percentage hits 100%, a screamer will spawn in your general vicinity, which can then spawn hordes of zombies until it's killed, resulting in some unexpected visitors. Now you've established a home, completed some quests and met the trader, you're ready to start compiling resources for crafting. There are a few types of resources which can either be harvested or scavenged. First of all, there are naturally occurring resources like the following. Trees, rocks, iron, coal, shale, nitrate, lead, plant fibre and silver, gold and diamonds. Most of these resources can be found in all of the biomes of the map. However, shale can only be found naturally in the desert and coal cannot be. So they should be relatively accessible no matter what biome you've started your game in. Obviously, different types of tools are needed to harvest each of these resources most efficiently, from axe for wood to picks for ores and minerals. Later in the game, you will have access to more advanced tools like the impact driver and auger, but for now, you'll probably be using the more primitive tiers of tool. You can find ores fast by inspecting your map. If there's an ore on the surface of the map, they'll show up with a unique colour so you can identify them easily. Lead will be blue, iron will be brown, coal is black and nitrate is white. Usually, after mining what you can see on the surface level of the map, there'll also be additional ore to mine right beneath the node. 
as well as the naturally occurring resources you can find in the wilderness, there's a huge variety of components to be found through scavenging and dismantling objects in the world. Cars are a great source of iron and other useful resources like radiators, engines and both mechanical and electrical parts. You'll want to keep an eye out for the intact and searchable variant of the car models as these produce the largest variety of parts from dismantling. Burnt out and wrecked variants will typically only produce iron, which is also useful if that's what you're searching for but the intact variants can produce radiators which are a great source of brass when smelted in the forge and used in the production of bullets. Batteries from cars can also be scrapped for 120 lead, which is an important resource in the manufacturing of bullet casings, as well as crafting vehicles in the later game. So cars are an essential resource to be salvaging early on as they'll provide you with much of what you need in a variety of crafting recipes. Brass is also an extremely useful resource which can be found in a number of ways. From smelting or scrapping trophies, brass doorknobs, brass radiators and even duke tokens if you're in a desperate situation, which are another key component to crafting ammo. Engines can be scrapped for a big injection of mechanical parts, with each engine producing 30 mechanical parts, which will be vital in the crafting of the workbench which also requires 20 mechanical parts to build. This is probably the most efficient way to get your crafting facilities established early on. Pipes can be really useful early game as well, as the pipe weapons only require these to be repaired, and early game are much easier to get a hold of than repair kits for more advanced weapons. Pipes can be found by dismantling sinks, toilets, washing machines, radiators, ovens, beds, air conditioners, cars and control panels. If you're struggling to find a wrench, the best place to look is under sink containers in residential buildings and in working stiff supply crates. Occasionally they can also be purchased from traders as well, so make sure you're selling excess and unwanted items for dukes when you can. If you're still running with the bow, you'll definitely need to source some feathers to craft arrows. These can be found in birds' nests, which once searched can also be harvested for an extra boost in feathers. You can also harvest feathers from both chickens and vultures, which can be found most prominently in the desert biomes. Harvesting resources from animals can be done most efficiently with the bone knife early on, but later on you'll have access to both the hunting knife and machete, which will increase your yields. Magazines determine your skill in individual specialities, with each discipline in the game having between 50 and 100 skill levels to work through, which are increased by reading the relevant magazines. Your current level in each discipline will also affect what material tier you can craft weapons and tools with, as well as the level the item crafted can be. Your loot pool will also be affected by your skills, with higher skills producing more relevant loot and magazines while scavenging. So if you specialise in shotguns, you'll find more shotgun related magazines, ammo and crafting components compared to other lower leveled skills. Magazines can be found in a number of places, like mailboxes outside of POIs and newsstands in towns and cities, as well as locations relevant to the theme of the specific magazine. So you'd be more likely to find a copy of Pistol Peter to Gun Store and Needle and Thread in a department store POI. By this point, you'll likely be approaching your first Blood Moon Horde, which can be a daunting time for new players. You'll be met with your day counter turning red at the beginning of the day to notify you the Blood Moon will be taking place that night. This is the time to start preparing for the Horde and making sure you have all the supplies you'll need and a good defensible position to take on the Horde. The Blood Moon will take place from 10pm to 4am the following day so there's a good amount of time to travel to your chosen position and get set up. It's a good idea to stock up on as much ammo as you can, as well as having a variety of different weapons from range to melee, so you always have a backup option should one of your weapons break or run out of ammo. The first horde is fairly easy and shouldn't be too difficult to contend with as long as you have a good position and enough ammo and weapons, with only one or two zombie waves being thrown at you on the first blood moon. Zombie waves on Horde Night are determined by your game stage, and game stage is determined by how many days you've been alive, plus your character level multiplied by 1.5. 
So for example, if you were on the seventh day and your level was five, you'd multiply 1.5 by five to get 7.5 and then add that to the number of days survived to get your game stage of 14.5. The number of zombies that spawn per wave also depends on the number of players in the game. The game stage of the players and the max alive settings determined when setting up the game in the initial world options. Finally, there are three methods of completing the Horde Knight. One being to kill every zombie in each wave determined by the game stage formula I just mentioned, surviving the night and making it to 4am when the blood moon ends and zombies revert to being weaker and slower like they had previously been or you manage to avoid all of the waves until they've timed out. Let me know what your top tips are for starting a new playthrough in seven days in the comments below. Leave a like if you found this video useful or learn something new. And if you'd like to stay updated with all things seven days to die and survival gaming, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Also, why not check out one of my other videos on screen now. Goodbye.